bit of an issue here, right? You, you do it twice, right? I think we should write down the procedure. You know how you should say, you're going to be doing it twice, so, and, and also you, you probably want to, you know, align it so that people will be able to see here. You remember what we did last, what did we do? Swap it around. Is this fine? Blame, sorry, what's your name? Sorry? Blessed. 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 Are the, are the colleague called Blessed. You must blame Blessed if something goes wrong here. He's the one in charge, but he's, he seems to be having trouble with this simple organization of... Yeah? How is this? Hmm? You want to you want to shift? Is this fine? The lady probably would need to move around. I don't know. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hi. <coughs> okay. Do you want to focus it so that people are able to see? I don't know if they'll be able to see. So on my own behalf, I'm just certain individuals. Right. We feel like maybe you are a bit too hard on us. Too hard on what? Okay. No, let me let me let me bring up my point. Very good yes. Um, we're just starting the course. Okay. So we don't know so much about that. Most of the times, we don't even understand what we're being told. So we try to study a lot about. Can Can I ask you a question before you continue? Which Which part of classification of computer systems do you not understand so far? Before I answer this question, I think the questions might have been easy, but maybe a way of phrase kind of computers. Since we're still learning. Computer. So certain phrases, certain words, confuse us. We're still babies right now. What what phrase? What phrase? Can you cite an example of a phrase that you were personally confused with? Yeah, but which phrase? Even if I had the answer, I just wrote something wrong with me because I was confused. I didn't understand. Okay. Maybe maybe you should try and help us. Since we're starting, we're just learning. Try to make us. Uh, love the course by also talking a second. Yeah, but whatever oh. we start. You had better love the course. Now here's the thing: if you don't love the, the only option you have if you don't love the course is you you swap. Where is she? Somebody recently swapped. Where's um? Is it Naomi or something? I don't know. There's someone who swapped the course. There she she's hiding. There she is. She came right. She swapped. You are the one doing psychology or something, right? It, is it? Oh, so there she is, right. Sorry. You're hiding. You look, are you twins or something? I don't know. Now, the only option if you don't love the course, you had better love it, is you swap. You must, right? No one forced you to, to take it as a first choice or second choice or something. No, no, no. Okay. So, the, by the way, one of the reasons why I was asking about tutors is the cost correction that's supposed to happen when, when we write the first couple of assessments, quizzes, and especially test one, they're supposed to be in part done by the tutors, right? Now what we'll probably be forced to do now is to start having revision sessions um, as part of our lecture sessions, which is sad really because we'll be eating into the times for the lectures. We still have a lot to cover here, right? So on the issue of confusion here, I, I really, the problem, I, I thought the comment that came through from one of you the other time via the mailing list was pretty interesting. It was like, uh, they were like, we don't know if it's she, he, or others. But they, they said that um, they said that uh, no the, the 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 quiz was too practical when the lecture sessions were the theoretical or something. When you are reading, you read to understand. You don't you don't read don't memorize. By the way, it won't work, right? Read to understand. When you understand, it doesn't matter how light on or choose the word or whoever phrases the question will be able to answer the question, right? Yes, this bullet. Just to cover what she should say. Yes. Mm. 
practical, so to say. Right. And not everyone is going to be a tutor or a teacher. Others will go in different places. Yes, yes, of course. So it's all about understanding and being able to, to do it ourselves. Right. You know, especially when we reach the, the stage where we start doing programming, I'm sure it's going to be a bit uh, more challenging. Right? Yeah. So I think the thing here is that we are getting uh, introduced to the way persons are phrased up. So mm -hmm. Sometimes we miscarry. Which is why, by the way, I'm, I'm, we are writing. 20 quizzes for a reason, right? And four tests for a reason. Because, no, it's throughout the course of the year, because we want to make sure that by the time you are fighting for the remaining 50 marks, you'd have already figured out exactly, like you, you'd know what to expect in terms of questions and everything else, right? This is good. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, we will. Precisely. And by the way, and by the way, yes, question. No, but but one of the reasons why we have we have for five minute long lecture sessions is so that we introduce you to things that you perhaps don't know. And we give you an opportunity to ask questions, right? We give you an opportunity to come and see us personally if you are shy. We've given you an opportunity to send questions via the mailing list, via Moodle. We've given you an opportunity to comment on the slides that we've shared, right? All these things we're doing are for a reason. We're trying to figure out how best we can help you. The, the best way of helping you is to give you an opportunity to come and ask questions, right? What else have we done? We put up that form to say, fill it in, blah, 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 blah. Only seven people out of now 53 managed to fill it in. I'm sitting there, why? Which form? The survey. <laughs> I explained I explain the reason why. Now I, now, I spent almost, what, five, maybe 10 minutes creating that survey, right? It's not like I have plenty of, or I have nothing better to do with my life, and I'll say, I'm going to create this survey and make it look nice and send it to them. I'm doing it for a reason. It's all part of the grand plan to try and see how best we can help you, right? Huh. Yes. My suggestion is that when you're lecturing, there are moments where you say, ah, you guys already know this. We don't know. That moment when you say, you guys already know this, we are blank at that moment. Oh. So it's, um, it's a, those are, so, yeah. We are asking you to She's turning into a, are you sick? We don't oh. know, so just explain and not, and not insinuate that we already know, because we don't know. Those are rhetorical statements meant to evoke, because I'm trying to figure out, I've only been interacting with you for what? For, I think we've only been together for maybe a little under six, maybe seven sessions, right? I'm trying to better understand how, how we can you know, conduct certain activities. Some of the statements are rhetorical. I say, oh, millennials should know this. At that point in time, I expect someone to just say, well, wait a minute, I don't, right? Can you explain that a bit further? I will stop saying you know then. I will just talk, preach, and then hope that. <laughs> can, we, can we, okay, two more questions and then we'll continue. We're running out of time here. And I also feel like some, when, like your notes, most of the notes that I've gone through are not really clear. And even if it asks a question concerning the notes, they are almost, too far for us to be able to relate. Okay. Even the examples that we give in class, I feel like there should be something we can easily be able to understand right. too far away from what they are thinking. Right. Right. On the examples, I, I try, man. I mean, but there are certain. <laughs> there are. There are. No, seriously. I mean, honestly speaking, there are. But there are certain times, like when we had our discussion of translators. I mean, what example would I possibly use that you people know about? I try, right? Which is why. Is it the last session or the other session? I went there and I, I, I wrote down two simple programs, one based on a program that's interpreted and one based on a program that's compiled. I know that perhaps the vast majority of you don't know anything about programming and whatnot, but I was trying to see how best I could explain those things, right? But on the, on the notes, two things. The slides are not notes. They're meant to be, they're meant to point you in the right direction, right? The last slide, has a bibliography, a list of references that you must go and visit. Most of the time, those things have detailed notes that you are supposed to go and read, right? Not only that, you're supposed to go a step further and do a little bit of research, right? 
Try and do a, just simple Google searches, and these days there's a lot of video footage, just go in YouTube and hi. You just type in some phrase that's related to what we're covering in class, and you'd be surprised, right? Yeah. You'd be surprised. Yeah. So those are, those are meant to be pointers. Those are, like, you know, not, most of them are just in bullet form, right? In fact, they're meant to help me not veer off and stray away and start talking about something that's completely different from the notes also. Make sure that we discuss uh, the things that we are expected to discuss in this course, right? Is that fine? Yeah, yeah. was there? Yes. But the object, we are dealing with facts here. We're not, we're not dealing with, uh, oh, how do you feel today? These are facts. <laughs> and because I can, you know, but it's true. The, the course itself, the way it's designed, no, it's true. The course, the way it's designed is, uh, if, your, if, if your answer is right, then it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. So there's nothing, there's nothing subjective about the quiz questions. Or in fact, any of the questions that we're going to write, with a few exceptions, maybe, if you are trying to see if you understand certain things, but none of the questions that we asked in quiz number two, or quiz number one actually, were subjective in any way. These are objective questions. But we can introduce some, I guess, a few subjective questions if you want. Like if you look at the past uh, test, at some point there was a, is it test number one or two? And people complained, right? A simple question where you ask someone to say, if you were to, is it design, uh, if you were to come up with a peripheral device, like if you have to imagine a peripheral device that doesn't already exist, what would it be and tell us what it would do and how it would be benefit humanity, right? People failed, right? You're, you're, being, you're being asked to just think about anything. Nobody cares if it's strange or whatever. It's something that should take you like five minutes or something, right? Doesn't matter if it's, it's, a, it's a hypothetical kind of scenario, but we're trying to see if you understand this whole notion of peripheral devices. If you want, we can bring a lot more of those things. But can we proceed now? Yes. We're running out of time. Now, ooh. Uh, all right. So, like, like I said last time, uh, uh, so, so I, th I thought we'd start with uh, this one. Okay, so quiz number three this Friday, right, is based on computer software. Um, yeah, it's, for those of us that did not write, for genuine reasons, did not, did not write quiz number one and two, um, the makeup is um, on the same day as the main quiz, but we write the makeup at lunchtime at 13. So come to the fifth floor, show up um, um, in room 515, where we work from, right? All right. Um, and then day after tomorrow, we don't have the class, we shall go to the lab and just try and see if we can consolidate this whole notion of computer software. Right, maybe just do a few things. If we don't finish what we'll go there for, we'll continue our lab session the other Wednesdays. So it's not my fault, uh, no tutor, so we have to try and figure out uh, what to do here. Now, I thought I'd talk a little bit more about the quiz number two here. I was actually surprised, really, but uh, it's sad, really. Only like about 70% failed and only 30% passed by way of like, what we're saying is like about 28.3% got more than 4.5 out of 10, right? So it's like a 45%, that's the threshold, the pass fail threshold. Very sad, really. And then if you look at the distribution of the, the grading here, this is encouraging. We know that eventually these people here, usually as we progress through the, the course, you notice that there's a shift, right? So people that are in here will probably shift up there. Um, what we noticed last time was by the time we we're getting to the discussion of is it memory or something, people had already figured out what was happening, right? And so the pe performance was somewhat better. We, we, we know things would be slightly better, but I just thought people would, would know where they stand and what not. And then if you look at like the distribution, this is sad really. Like the normal bell curve is supposed to, usually what happens, and this is actually applicable to most things in life, right? Um, in Zambia, for instance, few people are rich, super rich, few people are extremely poor, right? They live in abject poverty. The vast majority of people lie in the middle, right? So the same goes for this performance when you write the quizzes. We expect it to be like some sort of normal, we expect some sort of normal distribution. And usually what we expect for the normal distribution is the vast majority must get more than 50. So this thing here was supposed to be, this is based on the, the results, right? But it was supposed to have shifted somewhere here. This, this peak here was supposed to be somewhere on, 
50% black. But hey, hopefully we shall shift this. Eventually, we shall go there. All right, so like we said, can we take out uh, uh, the books? Let me just get the scripts. We have uh, test number one today. Ah, uh, hey, April Fool's Day, right? Now, one of the reasons why I one of the reasons why I put this up is uh, what what Google does on every first of April. Most of these major software companies they have uh, they have like uh, funny things that they introduce as part of April Fool's Day. So this year, right? If you use Google Maps, there's this game that you can play. It's in it's embedded within Google Maps, right? I use Google Maps a lot myself. So just go here if you don't. Um, have a mobile device like Android, iOS, or something, just go to this link. Okay. Um, so, we continue off our discussion of this thing we are calling the Voinomian architecture, and we actually began our introduction of the Voinomian architecture by, by really discussing this very important notion of the stored program concept. The idea that um, both memory and data are actually stored in the same location, right? Um, and we actually also pointed out the fact that uh, alternative models or architectures um, that are diametrically opposed to the Voinomian architecture. So example, the classic example gave was the Harvard architecture which stores program instructions and, and, and data in two different locations, right? Um, we discussed, uh, we pointed out the fact that even though the classic Voinomian architecture is only composed of four components, right? We mentioned the control unit, the arithmetic logic unit, the memory unit and the input output unit, but what we said was that um, we, we are mostly going to uh, kind of um, focus more on what we are calling the conventional architecture, which actually includes other important components that will come up often, right, throughout the course of this course, um, especially during our discussion of the ISA architecture, so registers and buses as well, right? Um, and we introduce buses as, uh, and define them as nothing more than these wires that we typically find on our motherboard that facilitate communication or transmission of signals between the various components, right? The high level functional components. Uh, and by the way, when we say these buses, it's not like it's one wire, right? It's like a lot of wires here. But, but because we are abstracting, we, we are using abstraction a lot, we, we are trying to simplify you know, things so that we better understand what is going on. Right, so we introduced control buses, data buses, and address buses, and, and really went a step further to, to kind of uh, explain the different types of signals or information that they transmit. So address buses, as the name suggests, is just uh, um, information about the register where the CPU is going to read data from, read data or instructions from, or write data or instructions to, right? Because what we are doing when we are ma manipulating data is we are writing and reading data from memory, right? Um, this is probably the simplest of all uh, functional units of Voinomian architecture. And then we, we ended our discussion um, when we started zeroing down into the, uh, the different components that we find on the central processing unit, right? Uh, huh, this is quite nice here. I, I, I don't know why I forgot this, but uh, some video came into my recommendations on YouTube. And this guy was, um, he was uh, cooking a small piece of meat, right, beef, using the CPU, right? It gets so hot. It's, so the video itself is, is meant to showcase the fact that because there's, there's a lot going on by the way of processing, this thing heats up, right? This thing, it heats up a lot. So it has to be cooled in a way. So it was just showing how hot it gets. And it's quite nice, I will share the video. I thought it was nice. Um, all right, so this is where we ended off. Uh, but just to repeat the fact that uh, um, this, this um, subcomponent of the central processing unit called the control unit does nothing more than decode. This is, a, I guess, one of the most important functions of the control unit, right? It decodes the instruction, yeah? So CPU fetches instruction from memory, right? Um, there has to be, in the fetch cycle, which we explain, there has to be a way in which the CPU is going to know exactly what that instruction is supposed to do, right? And the thing that figures out what needs to be done is the control unit. It figures out what needs to be done by decoding the instruction itself. Right? 
um, yeah, and then it also coordinates the retrieval of uh, operands, right? This, this notion of operands will come up a lot because these, these basic uh, instructions that we're talking about, um, they really do primitive, fun uh, primitive functions like add, subtract, you know, divide, multiply, perform logical operations, right? Um, and, and so for you to perform all those operations, typically you are, you are working with operands, right? There's an operator and there's an operand. For instance, when you're adding numbers, your operands would be the two numbers that you're adding. The operand would be like the plus sign, right? But we don't use the plus sign, we use like instructions like add A comma B, right? So you know that add is your operator, B and A are your operands, right? So the, the, the control unit needs to retrieve those operands, right? Um, and then it needs to figure out the exact order of execution of the programs, right? Um, we, we, we simplified um, some illustrations of, of how instructions are fetched, but I wanted to, if we can do this in the next class, but I wanted to highlight the fact that, in fact, because memory is, uh, they say memory is, is it byte addressable or something, right? And typically your instruction, like something like add, add a comma b, for instance. Um, if, if, you're, if you're looking at the MIPS architecture, that thing is apparent one word long, so it has 32 bits, right? And those 32 bits are segmented in such a way that um, the different bit sections or bit patterns are located to things like the operands, the operators, and some other fancy things that you might have there, right? So because memory is byte addressable and your typical instruction would be 32 bit long, byte addressable simply means that um, the things that you're storing in memory are stored within conti contiguous slots of eight bits, right? So if you have an, an eight bit slot in memory where you're putting in things and an instruction like add a comma b is 32 bit long. And there has to be a way in which you, you move, you remove sections of that instruction, it's 32 bits, so you need to remove, you remove sections four times, right? Four by eight is 32, right? So this is a control unit fetching these various, various um, bit patterns. So it will, it will maybe fetch the first bit pattern and realize, say, oh, the opcode here is add, right? So we must add. So I know that I'm expecting two operands to come after add, right? Until it finishes the entire the two bit um, pattern. I forgot to mention that. <clears throat> All right. Um, another important component here is the arithmetic and logic unit. Um, and an easy way of remembering what this thing does is the words arithmetic <coughs> and logic unit, right? So it performs basic arithmetic operations and logical operations. The people doing maths, I always like asking this question. What is the difference between arithmetic and mathematics? Any takers? Pause a little. There's a difference, right? Any takers? What? Come on, it's not an exam. What is the difference, in case you didn't, what is the difference between Arithmetic and mathematics. At what stage during this former education kind of system we are going through were we introduced to arithmetic? No. Yeah? The stuff we did in grade one, right? Yeah, that is right. One, uh, one divided by zero, it can't annoy all those things. One plus one is equal to two. That's arithmetic, right? Maths is like, apparently it's defined as a science of numbers. It's slightly more complex. Well, the point I'm trying to put across here is that the things that this thing called the ALU does are really basic and primitive functions, right? Adding numbers, subtracting numbers. It's um, another way of looking at what we are doing here is like when you, are, when you look at a structure like the school, of, it's a bad example, but we use it. The school of education uh, building, this bridge building, which has five floors, right? Like if, if we were to bring someone who has never seen like a, an X story building, for instance, you would sit there and wonder how did these people do this, right? If, it's so complex, right? I mean, you have what? Loos in there, you have labs, you have offices, you have computer labs. Yeah, and someone, taking someone around and saying, oh my God, what's happening here, right? But you realize that if you really understand um, the idea behind building a structure like this one, you realize that there's nothing complex about it actually. Just sit down and plan, right? Fundamentally, the things that people are doing in building this thing, you get a brick, you lay it, right? Based on the model that you have, right? So the, 
the operations that people performed when erecting this building were really basic operations that a person who has never gone to school can do. The same goes for the thing that the ALU does, right? Basic operations. I'll explain that. So examples is like adding numbers, for instance, right? But it also performs logical operations. Um, typically, depending on what type of processing is happening, you might want to, to do uh, either one of two things, right? You're, you have like a condition of sort, you know, so if I, if I jump, then do that. If I don't jump, then do this, right? It's a logical operation, yeah? Usually you, you typically use logical operators to, um, to try and work on conditions or something, Boolean, I guess these are usually Boolean operators. True, false type things, right? If this, then true, if this, then false, then do that, right? So the ALU does that. Don't worry, the chicken will come to roost here. This is coming back. We'll, very soon we shall really understand what is happening inside this thing, right? We were simplifying things here, but bear with us here. Takeaway point here is the functions that the ALU performs, right? Takeaway point here is the functions that the control unit performs, which is decodes, retrieves operands, right? And then we also have, have registers, right? And <coughs> Hi. I'm sorry? Sorry? Yes. Yes? Well, so what, what we're saying is, uh, yeah, we shouldn't have. Uh, so let's say, imagine the data that we're referring to here is a text file. Because we are saying that, uh, because we are saying that, uh, my goodness, because we are saying that, that, that there's a way in which data and instructions are located in memory. Remember, we said the memory is byte addressable. But some said they said it's byte addressable, right? And the byte is nothing more than eight bits. Yeah. Memory is byte. <laughs> Yeah, so a while back in the previous slide, I mentioned that memory is byte addressable. What we mean is that when this central processing unit needs to do something, and it requires to fetch something from memory, the way that it fetches things from memory is it, it does them in chunks, right? Those chunks are referred to as bytes. It cannot get things all at once, right? There's a way in which it has to collect those things. Remember, these are patterns of ones and zeros, right? So let's say you have uh, an instruction, I'll go back to the instruction, like add A comma B, which is, which has 32 bits, right? 32 bits is nothing more than one word actually, by the way. So it, it needs to get those things in, in chunks of, of what, eight bits, right? So what we're saying is sometimes the ALU can be used to manipulate those bits, depending on what you want to do, or what you want to accomplish, this is what we're saying. It can manipulate those individual bits associated with a word, for instance. Like, where is that? Is it here? Yeah, associated with the word. And usually, this is more um, associated with data than instructions, really, right? Because what we, we do, actually, when, when we're executing programs and whatnot, is what we're manipulating is the data, right? And we manipulate the data using instructions. <coughs> to change, to alter, to manipulate. Oh. We should, uh, now there's this piece, nice piece of software called the Google, you can go and do define full colon manipulate and then, I like that. All right, is this fine? Can we, uh, I'll try and think of a better way, of doing. maybe I can introduce an example here. Um, anyway, this is data here, keyword is data. <coughs> And in fact, the manipulation of data could involve uh, an example of like how to manipulate data. Is imagine a situation where you create a new file and you just write one sentence in that file, right? The next time you want to to add um, to add more content to that file, you'd be what modifying that file somehow, right? But what you do when you're going through that modification process is what you're going to load the program that you're going to use to manipulate that that file and also load that file which has data, right? Because fundamentally you're working with instructions, program instructions, instructions associated with the program and the data that you want to manipulate. So 
As you're doing the modification, you are altering the contents of that data, right? There you go. Um, and then comes these entities called registers, right? Very, I feel like I'm repeating things. We discussed registers, right? No, no, no. We were about to start talking about Okay. We're wasting time repeating things anyway. Um, yeah. So because of human beings' ob obsession for efficiency, right? You always want to do things as quickly as possible, right? Which is why you have, uh, what? Cloud, cloud computing platforms, right? Because a machine like the one that Lighton uses is not fast enough to do certain things, right? Oh, my machine is hanging. Or oh, if it's hanging, spend a little bit of extra cash and then just rent uh, some, some cloud servers or something and then do whatever it is you're doing in the cloud, right? So the, the obsession with efficiency actually even goes down into the, the basic functionality of the computer system itself. Because of what we do, you notice that we, we mentioned that your typical, your typical program will have uh, hundreds, thousands of instructions associated with it, right? Depending on what it is you're doing, it could be the case that when you're going through that fetch decode execute cycle, you're actually swapping out different types of instructions, right? At a very fast rate. But sometimes it's not fast enough. In fact, these days it's not fast enough. And so what people have decided to do is to say, wait a minute, how can we ensure that some of the functionalities of this entity called the memory unit, and when I'm saying this entity called the memory unit here, we, we are trying to simplify it by, um, for now, for, for just now we'll say, we are referring to, let's say, RAM, right? Because RAM is further away from the CPU, and in fact, because RAM needs to be connected using wires, uh, to the CPU. If you, if you look at those, um, those dim slots where you slot in RAM in your, in your, in your um, system unit, for instance, you notice that they're located far away from the CPU, right? And you typically need buses to connect the, the, the RAM, right? RAM chips, or the dim modules to the CPU, right? So, to increase, to, to increase the rate at which you're fe fetching and write or storing things to this memory unit, and especially for instances where you do something, but you temporarily store whatever processing you are doing, and then you need to immediately refer to, to the data or instructions that you're referring to. The question is, why can't we do those intermediate steps right on the CPU chip, so that we avoid making that round trip to the CPU? It's too far, right? Instead of having our lecture here, let's have it in the conference hall, because it's closer to where light on works from, right? To be faster. In fact, we won't even have to waste so much time and whatnot to be, a bad thing for you guys because you have to walk the fifth floor here. Is that a bad example? I don't know, right? But it's similar. It's a similar analogy, right? The closer you are to the CPU, the faster you're going to do certain things, right? So this is what registers do. They are nothing more than temporal storage location. And in fact, to, to kind of further uh, expand our definition of the memory unit, this memory unit doesn't just refer to RAM. We're referring to anything that stores data, right? So the registers, in fact, could be considered to be part of the memory unit, right? Secondary storage as well. So they are there essentially to just uh, speed up some of these processing, uh, I mean the processing that goes on on the CPU, right? Intermediate steps. Uh, you want to, you are, you are adding two numbers and then you need to subtract them at some stage and then store the result into RAM, right? So the question is, uh, no. so we are, let's say we are adding we are adding one. We are we are adding one and hmm. we are we are adding two numbers, right? One and we lift it briefly. Sorry, I apologize for this. This we must illustrate maybe instead of being abstract. So let's say we are we are doing two things, right? We are we are we are adding uh, we are adding a and b, right? And then actually we are adding a and b, and then storing the result into c, right? But then at some stage, our final our final op operation is to subtract uh, to subtract whatever. No, this is another bad example. Okay, we load. We'll, let, we'll load, 
we'll, we'll wrote the, the value 5 into V, for instance. Just play along here. And just it's a simple example here. We are loading, we have we have 5 in V. But what we want to do is we want to add A and B and put the result into C and then finally store store into C, store the result of subtracting uh, C from V, right? Now if you notice what we are doing here, we are re reusing certain things, like we are reusing the result of this intermediate step. So instead of us saying, once we, we add A and B and put the result into C, instead of saying, let's go and store this into RAM, right? And then when we are, if we store it into RAM, what we we'll have to do when we are subtracting C, um, subtracting C from V is, we need to go into RAM and fetch the value of C and then subtract it. So what we say, instead of doing that, why can't we just temporarily store C into the registers because they are on the CPU chip itself, right? This is a function, intermediate, most of these intermediate steps um, are the ones that make use of registers. Look at these registers really small, really. Um, yeah, I don't know where the clicker is, forgotten. Oh, here we go, okay. Is this making sense, right? <clears throat> right, and of course, because these things are expensive, they're, so registers are expensive, and if you look at your size of the CPU, it's so small, so you can only fit so, ma so many things, right? So you have fewer registers than your equivalent memory cells that are associated with uh, memory unit, that is RAM, for instance, in this case. All right, so some, some important registers that we are, and they're important here for uh, discussion that's coming later, this discussion of the fetch, fetch decode execute cycle, or the machine cycle as they call it. Uh, we're just gonna run, the, uh, run through them so that when we start our discussion of this uh, cycle, we don't really get confused here, right? So there are there's this special purpose register called the memory address register, right? And as the name suggests, again, keyword me memory, it's meant for addressing, right? So if you're doing any, 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 temp, any, any processing that involves temporarily um, kind of storing the, the address of whatever memory location you're working with, you use the memory address register. And in fact, when your CPU makes a request to memory to say, I want to read data from this register. Remember we said one of the things that happened here is the, the, the address of that register is transmitted through the address, the address uh, bus, right? It's transmitted through that thing and then it's going to be stored in the memory address register, right? You're doing all of these things because you're going through a series of steps before you can actually execute the instruction. Right? Memory data register, again, the name data is a giveaway here. Simply means uh, it temporarily stores what? Data, right? Again, fundamentally what we're doing is we're working with two entities, instructions and data, right? Temporal storage of anything to do with addressing is um, is stored in the memory address register. Anything to do with data is stored in the uh, memory data register, right? Is this making sense, guys? Another uh, special purpose register is this thing we call the program counter, right? Very important um, type of register. Because you're doing so much, right? Uh, so you fetch, I was giving you an example of add A, add C, <coughs> comma, A, comma, B, for instance. We said that 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 instruction is one word long, which is like 32 bits, and because memory is byte addressable, picking out chunks of that instruction will involve you picking out the first bit pattern corresponding to eight bits, right? The next eight bits, uh, the third pattern of eight bits, and then finally the fourth pattern of eight bits, right? So, as you are going through that process, you know, executing your instruction, parts of the instructions, and in fact the individual instructions are suited with the program, there has to be a way in which the CPU keeps track of what you're doing, right? That's where the program counter comes in. And it does nothing more than keep the location of the next instruction that needs to be executed. Imagine you load Chrome into memory and you have 1,000 instructions that are associated with Chrome. You, you execute the first instruction of Chrome. Once you execute that first instruction of Chrome, what the CPU does is, or what the program counter does is, it increments uh, it, it's, it's, um, it increments by one to keep track of the next instruction that you're going to execute, right? It, do, it does all of this as you are, as the controller is decoding that instruction and all those fancy things here. Yeah? Is, is this making sense, guys? Which,
Oh, yeah, this, is, this is, well, an, the accumulator is nothing more, it's another special purpose register. I mean, we, we are probably going to, usually people get confused here, we're gonna, we are going to, we're not really going to talk so much about the accumulator, it's gonna come up once we start our discussion of uh, uh, the, the data path and control, right? So how these, uh, the, the path that these instructions take, depending on what type of instruction it is. But the point we're trying to put across here is that uh, the, once the ALU does, let's say you add, add um, you're you are adding two numbers, for instance, and it's a temporal kind of uh, result that you need to reuse, it's going to be slotted in the accumulator, is what we're saying. The memory address, the memory data register stores the data that you fetched from memory that you need to work on, right? You've immediately fetched it. The memory address register uh, stores the address of where you want to read or write from. The accumulator simply stores things that you've processed, right? Intermediate results of things that you're processing. So adding, right? Logical operators that you're performing, whatever. Isn't this nice? Uh, so this is, this is a bit misplaced, but I always, as, as we're discussing the central processing unit, and I think this slide will also come back when, when we discuss the fetch, uh, decode and execute cycle, but I thought I would mention some of the things that people are normally curious about when we have a discussion of the central processing unit. So the things to do with efficiency, just to try and mention the fact that uh, when you have your typical CPU, um, there are certain factors that sort of collectively contribute towards the overall efficiency or how fast your CPU is, right? So, Obviously, a dual-core processor is much slower than a quad-core processor, right, to the same specs, yeah? Number of CPU cores. Obviously, the, the frequency at which the CPU oscillates, right, determines how fast your CPU is. So, for instance, uh, a 2.5 gigahertz CPU is much faster than uh, equivalent CPU that oscillates at maybe one gigahertz. Yeah? One gigahertz simply means it's one billion instructions per second. 2.5 gigahertz, gigahertz 2.5 billion instructions per second. Much faster, right? Cache size as well, this cache thing will, will come up once we start discussing the memory hierarchy, the different types of memory, right? This is some of the things that you find on the CPU as well. The more cores you have, the faster your CPU. Wow. Hmm. It's like, uh, if I had five hands instead of four, I would, I would maybe type faster, right? Instead of two, sorry. I would type faster. <laughs> All right, and then our, our final discussion is on the, the memory unit here. Um, it does nothing more than store, right, the data and the instructions. Remember the stored program concept? We're saying instructions that data are stored in the same location, right? That, that location is what? memory unit, right? Uh, yeah, so different types of memory units. The data obviously, data memory is used to read and write. Uh, I don't know what I was talking about here. We'll probably need to simplify this a little here. But we're just trying to ex expand on this notion that uh, the memory unit stores both data and, and program instructions. By the way, f the final, Storage location of, the, of these data and instructions is always secondary storage. It must be a persistent storage location. Right? One that will not um, lose data in the, in the event that we shut down the machine, right? So once, when all is said and done, the ultimate storage location for these things is what? Secondary storage. All right, so the data, data obviously, data, data memory, or if you want to separate these things, data memory is used to store, um, or it's a location where the CPU reads instructions from, right, and then um, instruction memory, data from, and then instruction memory is a location where the, the CPU will read instructions from, or write instructions to. No, read instructions from, actually. For instructions, there's nothing like writing. This is a thing. We're using instructions to manipulate the data, so we can only, what? We can only read the instructions that are stored in this memory unit, we can't write to them, right? Data is different though, we read and we write data, in this memory unit, right? And we're simplifying things here, right? You notice that, uh, I mean, once we, we start discussing this memory hierarchy, we'll, we'll, we'll get into great detail on the differences between the different types of primary memory and the different types of secondary memory, right? In fact, even fancy things like virtual memory and how, um, 
different operating systems get to implement that uh, technique, right? All right, so uh, just to emphasize the fact that uh, typically you would have a, um, you know, pri primary and secondary storage or memory, right? And when you look at primary memory, you can further have a distinction between read-only memory and, and, and RAM. Just to, to remind people that uh, when you're referring to ROM, it's primary um, memory that is non-volatile, right? So the things that you store in there are going to be persistent, yeah? The location where we store our BIOS is a classic example of read-only memory because whether we shut down the machine or whatnot, it, we will still find it there. RAM is not persistent, right? It's volatile because uh, the moment you shut down the machine, everything that you are working on, if you didn't save it, is gone, right? Oh, I lost my data because I didn't save, right? But it was there, it was the document was there. Uh, of course, people now have figured out ways of I guess trying to circumvent some of these things. They know that there are people that are not tech savvy, so they might not know the importance of saving. Uh, some applications automatically save things for you. Like the text editor that I use automatically saves things temporarily, right? Before I save them myself. So even if I, I shut down the machine, I'll probably be able to find a swap file located to what I was working on and I can retrieve the data. Um, and then obviously this, this thing we call secondary storage, right? Your USB sticks, um, your hard disks, uh, these are all classic examples of secondary storage, right? Your yeah, cloud storage, or Dropbox and whatnot, those are secondary storage. A point to note here is, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's non-volatile and it's persistent, but something else that's important is the fact that um, the CPU doesn't have direct access to secondary storage. We know this, right? We know this because we said that once once you, you are, once the CPU does its its own fancy things, um, what happens? The program first of all has to be program and data has to be loaded into what RAM. RAM is primary memory, right? So the CPU doesn't have direct access to secondary storage. Whatever it is, it needs to do. It has to fetch from RAM. Okay. Um, are there any? Comments so far, concerns, uh, do, you want, do you guys want to digest this and maybe come back with questions on what we need to clarify? Uh, what we are doing, by the way, is we are, we are setting the stage, one of the reasons why we're discussing the, the basic functionalities of the things to do with like memory address register, memory data register, the program counter, um, that's the registers, um, and these different buses is, we want to be able to understand exactly what is going on as we are going through the fetch, decode, execute cycle because that whole cycle makes use extensively of these things that we've just introduced. So that's why we're going through this so that we understand the fetch, uh, decode, execute cycle. So we will immediately transition. Maybe we can start. I don't know what time we have. Yeah, 50, 1050. Um, but we, if there are no questions, just wanted to mention that we shall, uh, we shall immediately transition to slide lecture series number six. And I deliberately... I deliberately kind of uh, separate lecture from last year's experience. We deliberately separate lecture five and six because it can be a bit confusing. I, uh, confusing. Idea, it's a short lecture which could have easily fused uh, the fetch, decode, execute cycle into this, into our description of the CPU, but I think it's best done once we explain, we, we give a high level picture of what's going on and then we'll start our discussion of the instruction cycle, the machine cycle. Okay, so I will see you uh, when you see me, which is Wednesday. We are meeting, please. We're not meeting in here. We shall meet in the library basement computer laboratory. For those that are not here, share this thing on the WhatsApp group, wherever it is you congregate from, right? So you, you tell them. We don't want people saying we didn't, uh, we came to class, but there was no one, right? All right, if there are no questions, uh, thanks a lot. We shall, yeah, I'll give them to the, oh, the papers. They're not mine, yeah? Uh, sorry, I wanted to mention something else, by the way. Uh, for some of us, we're going to be used as examples. Um, there's, there's a person that, that, you see, when you're told to stop writing, I'm, I'm, not being, uh, well, I'm not being a very difficult person when I say stop writing and hand over the, the script, right? In, in sessions like the final exam, that's serious, right? Someone can literally rip your paper apart. 
if you disqualify completely, if you don't follow the instructions. I'm trying to teach us the things that we need to do once we start doing these very important things like a final exam, right? So uh, some of you will be used as an example, like I use someone as an example, they, we deducted one mark because they continued writing and they handed in the script late, right? We want to get into the habit of doing that. So you can fetch your scripts from our very able class rep, one of the class rep. Yes, they went to the HOD and found out on our behalf what the 